Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Georgia Erger. I'm the curatorial assistant here. I'm the curatorial assistant here at the MSU Broad. Um, I have the pleasure of welcoming you to the 2019 MFA Talks. Um, this year, Loren Brady, um, Chelsea Markison, Mary Peacock, Murdad Sedegat, and Andrew Samoski are here to discuss broadly their artistic practices and specifically their exhibitions, which are on view in the second floor galleries of the museum. Um, following the artist talks, there will be a brief Q&A session. I'll start off with a few questions and then we'll open up um, the discussion to you to ask your questions of the candidates. Um, thank you once again for being here. On behalf of the MSU Broad, it's truly an honor to showcase the work of these five students um, in our museum and to work so closely with the Department of Art, Art History, and Design. Without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Teresa Dunn, who's going to introduce um, our first presenter, Lauren Brady. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia. It's with great pleasure that I introduce Lorraine Brady to you. And on behalf of her committee, including myself as our major professor, Tom Birding, Ben Duke, and Elisa Henriquez, it's very hard to believe that three years have passed by since Lorraine joined us in this Lansing until I took a look at the incredible transformation um, in her work that you see here in the Broad and all of her accomplish accomplishments since 2016. Um, Lorenz's artistic practice examines space, place, time, and memory, and through sensitivity to color, light, and surface, with deep empathy for the object, experience, spoken and written words, she manipulates, manipulates paint with an effortlessness that resonates deeply with the viewer. And through symbolic and poetic storytelling, Lorenz's paintings take us on a journey where the humble becomes holy and the forgotten is revered. During her time at MSU, Loren has traveled internationally on visual art in Italy as a graduate student participant. She then later returned to Italy as an artist in residence at La Macina di Cresci in Greve Chianti, where she worked independently for a month and gave a lecture on her work and participated in a small group show in Greve. She's shown in nine states in the US, including solo exhibitions at the Surratt Gallery at Vanderbilt University and Customs House Museum in Nashville and Grove Gallery in our own East Lansing. She's been included in various juried shows, including Art Now, Painting at the Ann Arbor Art Center, Land and Sea, National Juried Exhibition, Main Street Gallery in Clifton Springs, New York, A Sense of Place <clears throat> Exhibition, Gertrude Herbert Institute of Art in Augusta, Georgia, and the Manoogian Museum in Mackinac, where she won the grand prize for her a painting. In addition, she was also in, um, included in the Director's Choice 30 Under 30 at Viridian Gallery in New York City and was published in Studio Visits magazine. Um, another really important facet of Loren's professional practice here has been community engagement and outreach. And through that, she organized a pop-up show at the Cedar Street Art Collective and spoken form at the Meta Collective, which involved drawing and poetry, and, and an event that she describes as reaching out into the community. And those two events in total had over 250 participants and visitors. If that were not enough to fill three years at Michigan State, Loren was also a grad student member on three department committees, as a gallery research assistant at the Union Gallery and Scene Metro Space, and was instructor of record for drawing and color and design classes in our department. She also received numerous in-house awards from the department, from the Office of Education Abroad, and perhaps most importantly, the Dissertation Completion Fellowship, <clears throat> all to support her creative research. I will truly miss, and as you can see, I'm a little shaky here, so I'm um, mispronouncing lots of words, so I will truly miss you, Loren, your vibrant spirit, positivity, ambition, wit, wry sense of humor, and incredible skill and dedication as a maker, a painter, and a poet. Please join me in congratulating and welcoming Lorraine Brady to speak about her beautiful work. All right, can everyone, can everyone hear me? All right, so before I get started, um, with my talk, um, I just want to take a few moments to express my gratitude to several people who have been really instrumental in my time here at MSU and um, really have made this experience um, better than I ever anticipated. Um, I want to thank Jackie Sullivan, Robert McCann, uh, Luann Snyder, Walt Peebles, 
uh, Ben Van Dyke for their support, sharing their expertise um, and mentorship. I want to thank my guidance committee, Teresa Dunn, especially uh, Benjamin Duke, Tom, Thomas Birding, Aliza Henriquez. Um, these four individuals have spent a lot of time meeting with me in my studio and working with me, and I just i am so grateful for your time. And then I want to thank my graduate cohort because we are a mighty group of nine, and it has been a huge honor to work with you nine uh, strong, intelligent artists. And I want to thank my family for their continued encouragement, and then, most importantly, my husband, John. Um, he spent way more time in Kresge Art Center and hearing my grad school woes than he probably ever wanted to. Um, and it's really incredible to have a partner who's so supportive of my profession and goals. So with that, I'm going to get started. So traveling has always been a part of my creative process. Um, I create in response to experience um, with place and thinking about those memories that develop in those interactions. Um, I want to provide a little bit of context for, my, um, for the, the way that my work has evolved in the last three years um, and how it's informed sort of the way that I move through life and also my exhibition upstairs in the Broad. For the last two Junes, I've had the opportunity to, to travel to Italy. Um, I, as Teresa mentioned, I was a part of the um, Joe Art in Italy program where I lived and worked in Venice for four weeks, which was, I mean, I think everyone should go to Italy. It's a beautiful and a glorious place. Um, but what I want to really point out about that initial trip abroad was that I experienced a different condition of time and history that exists in Italy. And the past looms so large there. Um, you can see this in the architecture. Uh, you can see this in the bold colors and frescoes that have maintained that intensity over time. Um, you can see this along walls in sort of um, unassuming ways. <clears throat> and one moment in particular really struck me in the study abroad is when the, the group was touring Florence and we stopped um, at a particular location and our attention was drawn to these sort of insignificant marks on the wall underneath the, the street sign. Um, Florence had two really extreme floods in their history, um, one in 1577 and one in, or 1557, sorry, and then one in 1966. And these are just, the, the city has nodded and acknowledged these moments by a sort of um, humble and unassuming marks on the walls that really, if you're not looking for it, these will, uh, it'll walk on right on by them. When I was immersed in this new location in Venice, um, I was very aware that you know, language poses some challenges and that my, but because of that, my attention to my surroundings heightens. Um, I had this increased level of self-awareness everywhere I went. Um, I focused on body language. I thought about gestures um, and people in restaurants and seeing how people communicated with one another. Um, I listened to the tenor of conversations in, on the train to Rome, uh, trying to pick up, though I couldn't understand what they were saying, trying to pick up some of the, the conversation that they were having. Um, I felt the dampness that hung in the air, heard the low hum of the vaporettos in the canal, smelled the aroma of flowers mixed with the pungency of open trash bags in the streets during my morning walks, and sometimes I'd look for reminders of home. One of the influential texts that I've, uh, that's really been sort of, the most, well, maybe one of the most formative things that I've read in grad school is uh, The Poetics of Space by Gaston Bachelard. And uh, in this, he, he talks about how uh, reconstructing memories is really fluid and how in dreams, memories emerge from the shadows. He writes, indeed at times, dreams go back so far into an undefined dateless past that clear memories of our childhood home appear to be detached from us. Such dreams unsettle our daydreaming, and we reach a point where we begin to doubt that we ever lived where we lived. Our past is situated elsewhere, and both time and place are impregnated with a sense of unreality. It is as though we sojourned in a limbo of being. This limbo of being suggests a state of um, chronosthesia, which is basically our mind's ability to feel, to, to go back in time, to be in the present, and to also sort of project into the future and feel all those things simultaneously. Um, that liminality, uh, the tentativeness, and perhaps the fragility of memory, um, these are all really prevalent in my work, Remains Long Lost. 
So as Teresa also mentioned, I had a residency in the Tuscan countryside. And though I, I loved being sort of a recluse in this environment, um, I went to the city to see uh, very important artworks. I saw Giorgio Morandi in Bologna. Um, I went to the Uffizi, saw Pietro Lorenzetti's work, um, which I have displayed here, St. Humility and scenes from her life. Um, I saw many altar pieces when I was there, uh, both in, in museums and in churches. And something that I noticed about myself was that I wasn't really paying attention to the larger narratives, um, the, the center part of the altar piece, but I was more drawn to the smaller predellas that fell below or on the side of the, the main events. <clears throat> These predellas seemed more dramatic, they seemed more robust and poignant than the, the larger pieces that they, I think, supported and explained. I started considering the latent narratives in my surroundings. This residency that I attended was housed in a, a 10th century church. Um, and I was, when I was there, I was living in textures and amongst tactility. Um, the, there were gravel roads, there were prickly weeds um, in the olive groves and uh, my bedroom walls were crumbling. Um, I took daily walks where I would come across these roadside tabernacles just off the side of the road, once again, fairly unassuming. Um, <clears throat> and these small shrines often contained religious iconography uh, or just small figurines. Um, and though I wasn't privy to the full story or knowing, I didn't know the family whose property these things were on, I could sense that um, these were important objects that were being protected. Um, and these things even happened, they, they weren't always the uh, Lairs Capitules, but they were also things like the, the image in the, the far right um, with the perfectly placed shards of glass and terracotta and porcelain. Um, oftentimes I was given a partial view and therefore a partial understanding of what I was seeing. So back in the studio, I thought about this living in tactility, thinking about preciousness of objects. And I started thinking about how maybe I could treat my paintings as precious objects. I would hold them in my hands when I would paint small pieces, paint them, like sitting them in my lap and painting on them, place even a simple gesture of putting a painting on a flat on a tabletop. Um, there was a shift in my style of painting. I used to work with a lot of like layers of thin glazes to build up the surface, but um, that tactility showed up, began to show up in my work, and the painting was, became very dense and thick. Thinking about paintings as objects really catalyzed paintings in relation to objects. And though my thesis exhibition is not about Italy, um, the, the varying scale of works that I saw in altar pieces and cathedrals, the heightening of self-awareness um, for myself and for the viewer, the partial narratives, um, elevating the mundane, and the feelings of longing um, of the present and the past are our main uh, themes that influence remains long lost. In Remains Long Lost, I'm investigating the desire to gather, collect, and dwell on memories by looking at the heightened meanings attached in retrospect to mundane events and objects. Uh, this work, the, the umbrella that this work falls under, is uh, my time living in Tennessee, which is where I lived prior to moving to East Lansing. In this, this body of work, uh, there's poetry, original poetry, paintings, gathered objects that form eight distinct groupings of work um, in a format that I believe resembles um, what I would call like secular altars. Um, and in the process of building and creating this work, I was moving fluidly between uh, writing poetry, painting, and thinking about the three-dimensional space. So how would I arrange it in the broad? How would I move around it? How do I want the viewer to move around it? Um, so I have just a, a little bit about my background. I have a writing background. I have a minor from Indiana Wesleyan. And um, poetry and writing has always been a part of my process. It's a way that I, before I paint, I write it out. When something happens, I write it out. During a painting, I write it out. Um, <clears throat> poetry specifically appeals to me because it uses a vocabulary as reduced as possible um, so as to protect a single essential experience. And I'd like to read a poem, an excerpt of a poem by William Stafford that um, I think really encapsulates that idea of essential experience. Um, and it's been one of those poems that has really haunted me since, in the best way since I read it the first time. It's called Notice What This Poem Is Not Doing. Notice what this poem is not doing. The light along the hills in the morning comes down slowly, naming the trees white, then coasting the ground for stones to nominate. Notice what this poem is not doing. A house, 
a house, a barn, the old quarry where the river shrugs. How much of this place is yours? Notice what this poem is not doing. I've been reading a book by Reginald Gibbons um, titled How Poems Think. Um, and this is really interesting to compare the poetic space and the painted space. And so when I was reading his book, I'd oftentimes insert painting for poetry. But um, he says that poetry isn't interested in, the in what the characters are like, but instead what they are. Poetry is trying to convey the act of being and the passion and real feelings that can be based upon it. So I think that this is similar to the gleaning of information from environments and the combining of memories um, on the abstract picture plane. Um, this concept, um, I like to think of this concept in relation to the geotagging system that the brain creates where we can recall specific memories or episodic memories from a, a trigger, a song, a smell, something just, and we're back to that place. The objects displayed in my show were originally collected as souvenirs. <clears throat> now they act as reminders. These can remain static, like the river glass or stones that fall underneath a tabletop, um, mosses and dirt that I excavated from Clarksville Base and along the Cumberland River um, shrivel when exposed, they evolve when enclosed. The work is never completely able to be viewed as a whole. Uh, the sculptures and stacks block the entrance into the largest piece. Paintings on paper are stacked and precariously contained in vitrines. I want the viewer to be aware of the work and themselves as they navigate my installation space. As Rebecca Solnit says in A Field Guide to Getting Lost, to lose yourself a voluptuous surrender, lost in your arms, lost to the world, utterly immersed in what is present so that its surroundings fade away. In Benjamin's terms, to be lost is to be fully present, and to be fully present is to be capable of being in uncertainty and mystery. Like a poem and a painting, what is said and unsaid are equally as important. These eight installations represent specific people, places, and events, and the emotions that are entrenched in those experiences that I find myself unable to forget. Color in these works acts um, as ways to direct and emote. Um, the distinct formats, the arrangements, and the frame colors are very important to the conceptual underpinnings. And I just want to go through two uh, little installations and give some narrative background to them. I want to first start with the lavender grouping. This is based off of um, my one of my neighbors in Tennessee, Judith Kennedy. She was this little spirited 75-year-old woman who uh, talked to me every day as I walked my dog um, past her house. She would somehow always have milk bones in her pockets, in her flannel shirt pockets ready to give out. Um, we would sit in her pl old plastic chairs and watch cars go by. When she would go to Shoney's, which was like the waffle house in Clarksville, she would put on her nice lavender shirt, and that was very important, uh, that she looked very classy. Um, she gave me a box of wildflower seeds as an it's almost spring gift. She would start phone calls by saying, this is Judith Kennedy, your friend and neighbor. Judy was also schizophrenic, and sometimes she would go off her, her medication my friend and neighbor would fade for a time and to become over, overcome by paranoia, anger, so much so that she threat, threatened me and my family. Um, and I ended up having to stop communication with her because of, I was afraid of my safety. Um, I actually, we moved from Tennessee before I ever rekindled that friendship. Um, but I've heard that she's receiving treatment in Tennessee or in Nashville. And so I titled this grouping into she comes and goes as lavender grows in the south. I want to talk about this next grouping that I, I like to casually call the chartreuse pieces. Um, these represent sort of a panoramic view and narrative along um, Fall Creek Falls, a state park in Tennessee. And if you've ever spent time in the south in the springtime, you'll know that in, in the woods, the colors are so vibrant and bold, and they seem to glow, plants seem to glow around the, you know, the dead and fallen leaves. Um, the actual title of this series comes from the first stanza of a poem that I wrote, and I'd like to read that poem in full for you. We walked the gravel road, hugging the edges of shadows for protection from the October sun. We heard the whisper of water, danced in pools on cavern floors, the cool breath, our sunburnt necks. We climbed rocky stairs, looked from rain, looking down into the blanketing mist. Have you ever felt this small? 
You bent to toss a stone, watching it fall, sink into the abyss. From behind the wind's side into the trees, the falls moaned below, cave shouted silence. You shrugged and turned away. Remains long lost, seeks to pause, acknowledge, and reflect on the everyday through tendency and tenderness, reverence and reverie, memory and memorabilia, storage and stories. Notice what these poems are not doing. Notice what my installation has not done. Thank you for your time, attention, and empathy. I didn't realize it was this crowded. Now I'm nervous. <laughs> so anyway, um, when I come up to do these, it's always kind of bittersweet because it's a celebration because they're going on to celebrate the rest of their lives, but it's also sad because we're saying goodbye. Oh, we're saying goodbye. I guess you couldn't hear me. That's how nervous I am. <laughs> so anyway, this is particularly bittersweet because um, three years ago, I was the theory professor for all of them. So I worked with every single one of them as they sat quietly in my class. <laughs> and, I, and I watched them grow over these three years. And I do have to say congratulations. It is amazing up there. And if you haven't seen it, make sure you've seen it. They're totally amazing. I also want to say a quick thank you to the Broad for allowing us to be here and all the staff and faculty who actually help them grow in the way that they grow. Um, and I would also like to acknowledge the rest of Mary's committee. I was her major professor, and Paul Catula was on that committee, and DeAndy Simone. Um, so Mary came to us playing with toys. And it, it's still evident, right? She's still playing with toys. She just got bigger. <laughs> um, so she came to us from Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, with a BA in art history, and Southern Illinois University, Carbondale, with an, a BFA in ceramics. Um, since she was here at MSU, she's received numerous honors and scholarships, including the Dissertation Completion Fellowship, Students Making a Difference Through Artistic Expression, that was an honorable mention, and that comes through um, Paulette Granberry Russell's office. It's now changed, but that's where it came through at that time. And she also received an honorable mention from the International Sculpture Center's Outstanding Student Award, and that's an international award, and that's quite commendable to receive that. Um, She's also participated in several uh, group shows and several uh, projects where she curated, um, and particularly the, the comic forum. Her, her art history degree is in comics and punk comics, right? <laughs> Something like that. Um, and again, it, it kind of reveals itself in the show upstairs. Um, because Mary likes to talk, so we'll find that out. She was nominated. <laughs> for the TED at MSU talks, um, which unfortunately she didn't get, but she was at least nominated for that. Um, her work, Frequency of Disorder, which is the piece upstairs, um, is a feminist critique of domesticity, and she presents us with a very, very personal narrative, um, which is quite telling um, as you listen to the busy life of, of not just a graduate student, but a mother, a, a wife and the various roles that Mary has to, to, to play. Um, so anyway, Mary, I'm going to introduce you to Mary. It's been quite a three years, and I love you so much. Can you all hear me? Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Laura. 
That was really great. I really appreciated that. And thank you for almost making me cry before I talked. Really good. All right, let me get myself together. Okay. So before I start, I just want to thank a few people really quick. I promise it won't be too long. Um, I would like to thank my committee, <coughs> Laura Cloud, uh, Paul Takula. I practiced this for an hour today, and I still can't do it right. Katula and Deanne Simone. I would also like to, to thank Walt Peebles, Michael uh, McCune, and Brian Adams from the Lansing Maker Network. I'd also like to thank Luann Schneider, Ben Van Dyke, Jackie Sullivan, and last but not least, my family. Kit, Vinny, Ronan, you guys inspired this piece, so thank you. Um, I guess we'll get to it, right? All right, let's do this. So, this is me. Okay, good. I just want to start out with saying to you guys, I have a confession to make. I was actually a 2D artist before I came here. For a long time, I know, it's hard to listen to. But I wasn't always a sculptor. I actually did cartoons for a very, very long time. And I love my cartoons. And I absolutely love cartoons still to this day. There's something, even as a child, that attracted them to me, whether it be the extravagant body parts just bulging out or the bright colors. Absolutely. It wasn't until I got older that I realized that there was so much more to cartoons than we realized. When I got older, I got that adult humor or that dark humor. There are so many layers in cartoons now that you actually have to sit with them and find every detail. And I love that about cartoons, even to this day. So when I decided that I was going to do this piece, I still wanted to have a part of it within me. Sorry, I'm going to be taking drinks of water all the time because my voice has been in and out all, like, three weeks. But the one thing that I love the most about these cartoons was the humor and the adult humor. Now that I was an adult, it became even bigger to me. Have you guys ever heard that saying, I'd rather laugh than cry? Raise your hand. Come on, raise them up high. I only got 10 to 12 minutes here. All right, good, good. Because I feel that way in life in general. That is one of our mottos mottos of as, as a family. No matter how hard it gets, no matter how many times we have broken down and been like shoved against the ground, we would rather laugh about the situation than cry about it. So when I decided to do this work, I still needed some humor in it. So I did a very exaggerated arm. So every mom wishes she had one of these. One that can just spur out and grab that toy and put it back into the room without leaving and still doing the dishes and cooking at the same time? Yes. Okay, maybe we want multiple of those extending arms. But the thing of it is is that I wanted to continue that in this piece. I wanted you guys to feel the laughter and the most humorous way, even though this is something that is very, very important to me. The anxiety and the depression and the emotions that a mom feels, even if she has a wonderful partner, and I'm not trying to be saying that dads don't go through this either, they do, but even if you have the best partner in the world, you still feel alone. You still feel this anxiety. And that's what I wanted to do, to show. Oh, I'm hitting the wrong thing. Ooh, it went too fast. There we go. Again, with the layering, I have had so many layers in this piece, I didn't realize until I sat down with Lorraine and did my artist statement for the third or fourth time. I think it was the fourth time. And we actually talked about it. I'm a talker. I am not a writer. So the more I talked about it, I didn't realize how many things I did. If you look at the piece, there are rag dolls that I made from scratch. There is lace on the metal that I had rusted into it. The toys that I chose was a combination of my sons, both of them, 
and my own from childhood. The actual wood that I used was not only because it was practical and it was light, but because cedar is something that we use in our household. Steel is the same thing. Every single detail that I did for this piece was chosen. <clears throat> Sorry. The one thing that I wanted you guys to take away from this also was the cyber, um, the electronic part of it. I have been researching electronics for a long time. And one of my favorite things other than comic books and cartoon, and I want to say editorial cartoons is the animation. I wanted to see this move. I wanted you guys to be attracted to this piece. I wanted you guys to feel her actually grabbing and putting in, or she didn't grab and she didn't put it in. The things that break down. The electronics, the idea of being exposed. So in this, in this piece, I exposed everything. I didn't hide anything. Because I think as mothers, we need to speak up and talk about these things. We need to expose these things. I can only be the hero of my story for so long. I mean, even Batman got his back broken from Bane. Broken half, had to stay out for a while, but got back into the game. Something that I was always told is to be the hero of your story, never the villain or the victim. So even if you're broken, you get right back into the game. Again, comic book reference, sorry. But I'm going to show you just a brief part of her movement. Let's see if I can do it. Boop! There's a little bit of sound. Again, the sound is actually me um, recording myself. I found out through my research I recorded myself for three months to find out what I do every day for my children and for my husband. And it kind of got me a little depressed, but it was all right. It was all for research. I do the same thing every day from Monday to Friday. I made a list, I re-recorded it, and then I realized the second thing that I do. Every night that my son, my youngest son goes to bed, I sing to him two songs. Even when I went to Austria, I had to sing it to him twice. Chelsea is a witness. She remembers. She's shaking her head right now. So, I really wanted to show that repetition. It's another reason why I decided to use a robot. Because it can perform that repetition over and over and over again. As a mother, we are cyborgs. We don't realize it, but we are. But I'm going to leave you guys with one more thing. So as a graduate student, your professors throw a ton of artists at you and a ton of books. And you're supposed to read all of them. Sometimes skim them. But there was one book that I have struggled through quite a bit, but I love her. And I'm going to leave you with her quote because of one reason. It was the first thing that I felt I understood, and I want you guys to think about it in the long run. And I'm still struggling with her. But it's a really good, she's a really good author. It's Donna Har Haraway. And it says, the cyborgs is a kind of disassembled and reassembled postmodern collective. A, and personal self. This is the self-feminist must code. And I don't know about you guys, but that was like awesome in my head. I was like, yes. But I want you guys to think about that for a long time. Thank you so much.
Mary's a tough act to follow. Uh, amazing. I had the pleasure of teaching, uh, I say teaching, but really learning from these five uh, remarkable individuals in a professional seminar in the fall. And not, are they, not only are they incredibly uh, talented, as we see in the galleries upstairs, and thoughtful as we're hearing tonight, but they're also uh, authentic and, uh, uh, and delightful is the word I would use, individuals. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here to introduce uh, Andrew Samoski. Uh, Andrew, right on cue, drop that for me. Well, create a distraction. Um, I was told right when I walked in tonight that I had to an introduce Andrew, and I should, should have known this because I've done this for four years on and off, depending on whether I'm a major prof, but uh, it's a little bit of night at the improv, but it's, uh, it's easy because Andrew has been a remarkable uh, person professional and uh, artist to work with over uh, the three-year period that I've gotten to know him. Andrew, uh, before he was accepted to our program, uh, Andrew, uh, I, I, I called someone uh, that he studied with at University of Akron, and I said, is he the real deal? Because we only got a few spots in this program. We're highly select across all our areas, and it's very competitive. And our faculty really lo loved your work and everything you projected in your application. But he came with such, uh, such wonderful um, references from people I knew well and who had national reputations on their own. And many of the students who find their way to our program come through the connections of faculty. Um, and uh, it's uh, our network that you will all then uh, spawn as you go out in the world and send us uh, students as remarkable as yourselves. That keeps our program at a high level. So um, we knew we were getting so many top flight. Andrew's got all the, the street cred that uh, these other uh, individuals were uh, uh, badged with is by their major professor. Uh, by the way, I'm Tom Birding. I'm Andrew's major professor. Did I say that? <laughs> I'm just entering as if I know you all, which I know many of you. but. Um, uh, sorry about that. Um, I always say don't overlook the obvious and search for the profound, and maybe I just did that. But um, Andrew has all the street cred earned out in the world by uh, having exhibitions and winning fellowships inside the university, like the Dean's uh, completion fellow Dissertation Completion Fellowship, Summer Teaching Fellowship, came with the uh, College of Arts and Letters Scholar Award, top scholar award. He had a remarkable exhibition out at uh, the Urban Institute of Contemporary Art, one of the few graduate students across the state uh, chosen to exhibit in that fine uh, venue out there. Um, over the time of, of three years of study here, Andrew studied with a lot of faculty and has took, taken art history courses, uh, Master of Fine Arts seminar from a number of uh, faculty as well, but I wanted to acknowledge uh, his committee, uh, Ben Duke, uh, Teresa Dunn, and Elisa Henriquez all worked very closely with Andrew along with myself as we guided him through his work and he guided us over his journey. Um, Andrew's work upstairs I think is clear proof that you don't have to starve a sensation to feed a thought. Uh, it's uh, work that is both conceptually rich and visually engaging and, uh, uh, and compelling. Um, it incorporates a compelling array of influences and synthesizes multiple input streams, ranging from deep reflections on highly personal issues and ways in which he's learned to navigate life as one who has uh, uh, developed strategies to mitigate his dyslexia and dysgraphia. But it's also work that goes beyond the personal and reaches to uh, some of the most uh, compelling issues of our time, migrations of meaning that occur when languages and systems interface and sometimes confound us all. The work also turns an eye to the history of abstraction. Uh, with its cutouts and cutaways, it seems to be uh, in dialogue with some of the most profound artists of the 20th century who worked in this realm. He's been an amazing individual work to work with because of his openness, his ability to tolerate ambiguity, to work through difficult, to difficulty, and to trust his making instincts. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce Andrew Samoski. Uh, 
Um, thank you, Tom, for that introduction. Um, I'll probably be kind of stumbling around the same kind of talk that you just did, so thanks for setting the stage. Um, I'd like to start off by uh, first and foremost thanking my wife, Emily Samoski, who without her, I don't think any of this would be possible if I'd even be here, um, so thank you. Uh, after that, uh, it's been such a privilege to be here at MSU. Uh, I, I'm always thankful for being here and um, have kind of used that as a way to kind of move forward of always being thankful and, and working my hardest uh, and trying to do my best in this place that, again, I feel so privileged to be a part of. And the cohort that uh, and the community that we've created, all nine of us, uh, has been very valuable and I've cherished very deeply. I'd like to thank my committee, Tom Birding, uh, Teresa Dunn, Ben Duke, and Elisa Henriquez for your guidance, uh, for your challenge, for your critique, uh, for your friendship, uh, for the long conversations of trying to work through and think through uh, ideas and uh, trying to grow, uh, not as an artist, but also as a person uh, in this uh, world of art. I'd like to thank Jackie uh, for all her hard work and guidance and uh, jokes and uh, fun working with her in the galleries. Uh, I'd like to thank Walt for all the times we've talked and covering the wood shop and working with you on my projects and talking through ideas with you, um, not from the artist space, but from the maker space. And that's where we definitely come together. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Luann for always being there. Uh, Whenever we need anything, even if it's a cup of coffee from the art store, it always goes on her tab. Um, so with that, let's uh, get started. It's going to be brief. <laughs> I would much prefer to lock myself away in the studio and be the person behind the scenes rather than the person on the stage. Um, but here we are. So I'd like to uh, start off by kind of summing up how I got to where I am, how, how this process started, um, as a way of maybe trying to figure out where it might go. And that's always been something that I've tried to do, is create a system or create something where I do not know its end goal, so I can be you know, lost in wonder uh, and uh, in the process of making. So really this uh, body of work uh, really got started um, at the end of my second year, um, just over a year ago, um, where I started to try and blur the lines between uh, product and source, uh, between complete and incomplete, uh, as a way to talk about uh, what, con what uh, constructs uh, our identity and all of and its multiplicity and how it's not fixed. Um, that what identity is, is this kind of construct. Um, and what we think is incomplete or complete, that these are constructs that are created that uh, inform us or that we are informed by. So that was really when I was getting into these ideas of these systems. So this led to the thinking about systems and constructs just in general. And like, what, what are those things that control or uh, dictate uh, how we perceive our world and how we perceive ourselves within that world, how we navigate our world? And in that research and in that thinking and reflecting uh, in, my in my environment and to my environment, I um, found a, a sociologist named uh, Anthony Giddens and to quote him on one of these ideas that he has that's been very influential, informative, uh, it's kind of a keystone, a cornerstone to uh, this whole construct, to this whole system and this body of work, uh, is his idea of duality of structures. And just that simple idea that structures are dual. Uh, that uh, structural environments constrains individuals' behavior, but also makes it possible, right? So, something can't exist without the structure, but the structure also limits what could exist. So there's this kind of reflective state of back and forth. 
You know, and so it leads to the question of why are things the way they are? Just these simple questions, and most of my work does start from these very simple places of why, how. So this leads me to uh, how do I create a system? How do I talk about systems? For me, work has always been a process, and that's definitely how I would uh, or talk about myself as a process-based artist. But that's the most or the first thing that I think about. And work for me has never been really personal. It's always been looking out into the world and reflecting on it and talking about it, very removed from myself. And within this program, within this time here, um, it has been a little bit more self-reflective. And what are my influences? Why do I make? Why do I make? Um, what are those reasons? And what in my life outside of art have influenced me in moving forward? Whether it being the, the 10 years in uh, construction, uh, that working with my dad, um, which started you know, influencing me not only in this body of work, but the body of work right before this, um, but also the thing that I never really liked to talk about growing up, the thing that you know, I'm, in these, even though I'm 30 years old, I'm finally getting a handle on being dyslexic and being dysgraphic and how that removes me from certain aspects of uh, our social constructs, that everything we, uh, how we navigate is all through language, all through text. And for me, I'm outside that. It's, it's something to work into. It's something that's a constant uh, decoding for me where it's more learning through context rather than through reading. So how do I speak about a system uh, and constructs that shape our behavior and in, re and in turn our identities? Uh, for me, it was that text and language to actually confront it, to deal with it. Um, and to use it for my advantage, or to use it to enter into this conversation of constructs, enter into this dialogue in some way. Um, and through that text, uh, like Tom said, folding in that abstraction, that by abstracting these forms, it opens up the conversation even more uh, to where it can start to shift and be very malleable to so where it can start off being about text, but it can move to these other structures that do uh, control or influence how we react and how we navigate our spaces and our world. So in a way of how do I talk about it was just really how do I represent it? How do I represent life? How do I create that system? Um, and to do that, I kind of had to step outside maybe some more traditional ways of making for me because I, I came into this program being an oil-on-canvas painter. Um, so it was breaking outside of that. And if I'm talking about a system, if I'm talking about um, life or structures, or I'm talking about human and identity, uh, these things are never permanent. They're always in flux. They're always changing. They're always moving. And if I'm making something that has a fixed point, then how does that communicate those ideas? So the first step was, those, uh, that lexicon of information that was just up here, of just finding source, abstracting from text, layering text over itself, uh, finding the negative spaces of that text and using that as form where process and product become blurred and they flip-flop as to what they are and where they sit uh, in, in place. So with these, this image, it's... Uh, four separate sheets of Duralar, which is a uh, form of acetate. But what it was was thinking about if a paint, a paint, how can painting not be fixed? How can painting always be in flux? So these layers can always be reshuffled and moved uh, and translated and worked on top of where each layer might influence the layer, depending on how it's shuffled in. And from there, it definitely grew into um, crossing the boundaries just between painting. If we're talking about systems interacting and colliding and where new information uh, can be found through that collision, uh, it became uh, sculptural uh, where uh, they could overlay or they could expand that kind of understanding how 
again, where's the process, where's the source, and which one came first, uh, what's incomplete, what's complete. And it became very apparent that installation was the way it was starting to move. Um, you know, again, like how can one thing communicate this idea of systems when uh, it's a single entity? So it really became about the system and its growth and uh, how I started to kind of, when talking about it, uh, confuse my language or pull from different sources when I'm talking about genetics or biology or DNA and how that, that those ideas of growth and how uh, using a form or its inverse form, it's the residual of its previous self. So it has this DNA there and it moves through uh, and transforms into another uh, existence. Um, but each time it became a different installation. And I like that idea, this idea of it's always ever changing, it's never fixed. Every time it's installed, it's a new form, it keeps growing. The system is meant to always grow uh, where as we call it, generation one form can interact with maybe generation 10, generation 20, and be you know, installed in the same space. And what new interaction, what new relationship happens uh, when those things come in contact with each other? What new form can happen from those two generations, different generations coming together and new shapes being made? Again, I'm talking in the here and now, but I'm also projecting in the future. So it, it isn't one or the other. It's trying to encapsulate all things all at once and trying to see uh, or work through it. Making for me uh, isn't a place of answers, it's a place of questions. It's a place of play. So every time it's uh, re reinstalled, it's a new installation. It has the same parts, but each time it changes. Uh, each time there's more forms, each time there's more relationships. Or this idea of maybe the, the profound could be found in the multiplicity and not in the reduction. So coming here to the Broad, and what a great opportunity it is to show in such an amazing large space with the support of such a, a great staff here. And the person I was paired with, Zane, um, was just a, a great help. And um, working here, it's again, now I'm thinking, what, where could this go? I don't want to put boundaries on this particular process yet uh, to where this might become more interactive, where it might become more um, um, not just interactive, but where it could may become more performative in some way. And I'm not sure yet where that might sit. And I'm excited to figure out where that might go. Um, with this particular body of work and its continual growth, uh, the title is Relative Fictions as of now, but I don't know if that's going to stay. I thought about it being as maybe chapters, and each time it's installed, it's a new chapter of itself. Um, but within the six weeks that it's up, I'm going to continually come in and change it, move things around, manipulate it, play with it. Because ultimately, uh, my goal is to create a space, a place of contemplation, uh, a place of questioning, of figuring, uh, of maybe decoding, a place of play. Um, and I'm excited to see where it might go. Uh, it's a, for me, it's about the question. Uh, it's about the questions, not the answers. It's about the process and not the outcome. Um, thank you. This will be a problem, you'll see why. <clears throat> I'm Merdad uh, Sedegat's uh, major professor, and I'm joined uh, by Zach Kaiser, Professor Zach Kaiser, and uh, Rebecca Tegmar. 
There are things we know about Merdad, and there are things you may not know about Merdad. We do know that he is from Mashhad, Iran, which is a city of three million people, right near the border of Afghanistan. We know that he has an undergraduate degree from the uh, University of Applied Science and Technology in, in Mashhad. We know that he has received numerous awards during his time here at MSU, including uh, the Hollander Award, uh, Dissertation Completion Fellowship, uh, the SCRAM, and some other ones probably. Uh, we know that he is incredibly kind, we know that he is incredibly clever, and we know that he will be incredibly successful. What you may not know is that uh, he gambled his well-being on an education at Michigan State University and that of his family. You may not have realized that he came at a very complicated time in our country's history. The Muslim travel ban had uh, been announced during his first year here, and he and I had a very sobering conversation in his studio. He said to me, I get choked up every time I think about this. He said to me, will I be able to go home? And if I do, how will I get back? You also may not know that while he was here at Michigan State, he got married. You may not know that despite the incredible amount of time and energy that he spent teaching and doing his work in his studio, he also put together an exhibition of 70 Iranian designers here at uh, Michigan State University. It was extraordinary. In addition to that, following that exhibition, he did an exhibition in Mashhad, Iran, of over 60 pieces by Michigan State students. You may not know that uh, Merdan, <laughs> Merdan has had 24 interviews for faculty jobs, which also means 24 letters of recommendation. <laughs> yeah. Multiply that times three uh, uh, people on his committee, um, including he's leaving right after this to do yet another one. Um, he also has a job offer pending. Congratulations. You also might not know that Merdad was, was named uh, one of the 2019 <clears throat> excuse me, students to watch in Graphic Design USA. Have you seen this? Have you seen it yet? You know who gave this to me? A guy who lives down the street. Have you seen it? Uh, this guy who <laughs> yeah, lives down the street from me. He comes up to me in my driveway. I've only talked to him about twice in the four years I lived there. And he said, hey, Ben, you, live, or you work at uh, Michigan State. Look at this. Turn to page 68. Do you know this guy? I Googled him, and he's amazing. And I said, Indeed, he is. What you may not know about Merdad that you can learn in this magazine. <laughs> that, Mer Hold on. that Merdad plays the dutar. Does anyone know what a dutar is? It's, it's beautiful. I googled it. It's a beautiful <laughs> instrument. It's like a two-string lute. It um, has a wide body, relatively small, and a really long neck. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, I, for one, and I bet this entire room, would like to hear you play it. So we're going to arrange that somehow. Um, also, uh, I'd like to say, oh, you know what, one last thing. Merdad's favorite movie is Forrest Gump. I learned that here which I think is really interesting for many reasons. Uh, but I want to say to you, Merdad, what you may not know is that we are all in awe of your resilience, your courage, and your determination. And for this, we thank you. And uh, one last piece of advice from your favorite movie. Now, the secret to ping pong is, no matter what happens, never, never, never Take your eye off the ball. Merdad Sedegat.
Oh, can you hear me? Ah, you changed the direction of my talk. <laughs> so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna talk about that. So wow. Thank you, Ben. It passed fast. It was like two years ago I was sitting over there the first time I came here. So uh there are some moments in our life which uh, change or which plays as a turning point in our life. So uh, in 2015, before I came here, I was working in uh, one of the tip, uh, top 10 advertising agencies in Iran. So in Tehran, I had a, a good apartment in downtown. I had a good income. So. Uh, I had my car, so uh, the salary was high. So I had a, like a, a above average living style. So I don't know why I decided to apply for the <laughs> fair. So uh, it was just something like here or here always poked me. Come on, come on, let's do something different. You're not that guy, you're not that person to sit every day in front of the computer and have a brief and design based on that. You want to you wanna have your own voice. Uh, I don't know why you got admission to me, so I came here. But I know it's changed my life. So, uh, right. the mission of art and design throughout the history is always changing and varies based on human needs and the demands of society. Artists and designers reflect on their societies through their work and are often later referenced by a historian and sociologist as a crucial source for the study of those very societies they hail from. As an artist, designer, citizen, my work and creative research are not apart from the community and situation I live. Instead, they involve a critical observation of society and draw from my experience within it. So yes, I came here in really hard part of history of this society, especially for me as an Iranian and Muslim here. So just you have a idea where is the Iran in the Middle East and uh, how big is that size in comparison with the United States. So I flew like 21 hours but it wasn't direct like this. So I traveled to Doha, then I went to Chicago, something over there, then I arrived to Lansing. So uh, my move to US from Iran to continue my education brought about many challenges. I initially felt a loss of a large part of my identity being away from my culture and all that was familiar to me. Instead of ignoring these cultural and environmental conflicts I encountered, I decided to explore these differences as the very content of my research and creative activities. Uh, this uh, experience of moving to a new country and facing diverse cultures, uh, races, and custom has inspired me to both study human differences and to find solutions that bring people and uh, their varied outlooks together. So this living and making in between two different cultures coupled with my interest in the intersection between art, design, society, and technology has led to my discovery of a new hybrid-like sensibility and laid the foundation of my future artistic identity. So uh, I just drawn to that way because I moved from a majority to a minority. So it's changed my point of view to my Iran. And I really appreciate that change and that move. Uh, as a professor, you probably every year get a lot of requests or application for students all around the world. And you probably compared their works with the American applicants here. But please consider that the living experiences and how this selection and admission process can change their life, just as a suggestion. So, uh, yeah. 
So in the past 40 years, the political and a diplomatic relation between Iran and the United States, especially after Islamic Revolution and the hostage crisis in Iran, have converted to darkness. The Iranian government considers the United States to be misfortune, I'm sorry, which seeks to spur division among the Muslims in the region, the Middle East, to steal its oil resources. In turn, the U.S. government has characterized Iran as among the axes of evil to describe foreign governments that sponsor terrorism and as South weapons of mass destructions. Just to make sure it's all okay. So, uh, from the small amounts of time that I have lived and studied in the United States, I've learned that despite these political and cultural conflicts between the two countries, people are inevitably close to each other. As a human beings and uh, are similar in, the, in their fundamental desires. One of the reasons for these disputes and malik may be due to the lack of proper knowledge and incomplete information shared or made accessible to another. For me, these observations uh, goes, uh, go beyond the political and re political relation between Iran and the United States and hand, uh, have deeply shaped my view as an educator, designer, and artist. So, uh, yeah, this is, that was what I figured out when I lived here during these three years. So we are so close, so I'm from Iran, so probably uh, Iranian uh, defined as a, I don't know, terrorism, or as I told you, people who support terrorism. So look at me. Do I look like a terrorism? Or uh, do I look like a monster? So probably not. Uh, I figured out. So uh, our knowledge about each other, you know, covered and limited by media. So in Iran, media is uh, directed by government. So my knowledge before came here was uh, about the American and United States was like uh, limited to Hollywood movies and what the, uh, the government's media uh, introduced me. So, but as I live here, I found it totally different. And probably your knowledge about Iran is in the same way. But if you look at this, we are dancing like you, we are protesting with our rights, and we are uh, breathing, we are human. And also, uh, during my MFA and uh, my research and this, uh, interest here, I figured out that uh, it's not only about the cultures and peoples, and sometimes it happened about technology, about our understanding of technology. So, uh, and I, I found, as an artist and designer, probably uh, this is my responsibility to design an uh, outlook for technology, for growing technology, to bring it more in service of the, the human, in service of the society, in service of the culture. If not, probably uh, the structure of the power, capitalism, consumerism do it for us. So let's watch this sh very short video from Ahmad Ansari. So I just wanted as a uh, designer to make and play my role in working with the technology. So I'll talk more about that during uh, uh, when I talk about the, this show upstairs. So uh, I started to educating people about these cultures. So uh, I had a show in Iran which I called, called a placement. I wanted to people to uh, have a like a immediate and direct and closer a view of the 
the what's happening in the United States. What is the re real American? What is the real United States? So uh, I was as a person who lived here and I wanted to share my experiences with them. And also I did the same here. For this project, Jam Jam, I collected 15 cultural and uh, 15 cultural events happened between these two countries and I wanted people through the game, I wanted unconsciously educated them more. So, which I figured out because of the, the, the lack of this kind of proper education, this uh, misunderstanding always happening. So yeah, this is uh, the card people played that uh, probably most of you are familiar with this project. So I wanted to make a room for a discourse between the cultures, between the societies, between the peoples, by art and design. But for the project I made here for the second year show, I first I wanted to focus in the problems between Iran and the US, like the political problems. But <coughs> like a, a month ago, I just changed that. I brought up my stories into that. Because I'm a person, probably you are familiar with that. So you are all, you are all knows me. So we talked together, uh, we danced together, we went to party, we, we went to restaurant. And I wanted to show you immediately and directly and as a first hand how things happening for people who are from another culture. So I, I, I brought like a seven stories uh, from my living experiences here. For example, this one was about travel ban, which uh, I said travel ban has signed and borders are long lines. I've burned all, all the maps and know I have arrived at the airport. Protest has taken over. This is the only place in the world that no president's voice is heard and uh, politicians don't dominate. Sit next to me and put your head on my shoulder for being my country. All the world's immigrants are homeless. All the world's immigrants are sad. So also, I want to show you how uh, you, as a people here, as an American, or as a people of the host culture and society, plays important role in creating and shaping identity of the immigrants. You are always are watched and always are analyzed, and uh, every single's behaviors and moments can affect and them. So again, uh, back to our history where the type and image interact together. This is the most important and most interesting part in graphic design for me. I made that part. So I wanted to bring you to uh, unconsciously calibrate and interact with you and show how you are as a part of the identity of the immigrants here. So there are a lot of non-American, a lot of Muslims, a lot of people living here which are not American, but you are interacting with them. You are making their identities. You are important for them. And finally, the people who I worked and lived with them here. So uh, first of all, Ben. Thank you for your unlimited support. Thank you for everything. So uh, I did whatever I wanted. So thank you for that one. Uh, yeah, Zach, you're phenomenal. You're just hard to find, but you're great. Uh, I don't know if Rebecca is here. She, she has a sweet heart. I learned a lot from Kelly. So uh, Jackie, who's Jackie? I'm sorry if I was a uh, very bad colleague, so specifically this semester working at the gallery. So I, uh, yeah, I traveled a lot for a job interview, so uh, I wasn't really good. And Luan, Luan, where is Luan? Okay. You always made the crazy for me like a home.
thank you. You know, she, she replies in Farsi for me in my email. She's great. I love you, kid. That, that, that is, that is, wow, what? I couldn't imagine how it could be happened for me, this MFA without your support and help. And thank you for banana breads. The Emmy made for us always. And you, my grad friends, you are phenomenal. I learned a lot for you. I can remember the first class with Laura. I was like shocked. I couldn't, I couldn't understand even one word. So I, I, arrived, I arrived like at 2 a.m. And a day after that, I had a class with them. So I couldn't have a time. I even hadn't have a time to being under the cultural shock. So, uh, and Tom, thank you, Tom. I couldn't imagine how this job market could be happening for me without your support and help. Robert, I learned a lot from your takes, you know, you provided to us. Everyone, everyone, so thank you, everyone. And thank you. Hi, my name is Qais Asseli. Uh, I'm a visiting professor in the Critical Race Studies. Uh, Chelsea's Markson's professor, major professor, is not here tonight, but in Minneapolis. Uh, he's attending the National Council on Education for the Ceramic Arts. Um, Paul asked me uh, to tell this to all the third year's students. Uh, candidates. Uh, it has been a highly rewarding experience to have been surrounded by your creativity, energy, and professionalism. Uh, I wish you all much success as you continue your path in the arts and to Chelsea. Thank you for asking me to serve as your major professor. I have learned much from you. Chelsea's Markson's work has been presented internationally uh, and nationally at venues including the Urban Institute for Contemporary Art in Grand Rapids, Carnage Center of Art and Art History in New Albany in Indiana, University of Nebraska in Omaha, and Annex Gallery in Detroit. The last summer, she was invited to participate in a three-month residency at the P. Luten Kucha international art program in Germany, where she conducted public and private site-specific performances in and around the city. Chelsea received her BA, BFA in 2016 from Indiana University Southeast with a concentration in drawing. At Michigan State University, she has received numerous fellowships, awards, and grants, such as the Summer Support Fellowships through the College, Art and the College of Arts and Letters, Graduate School Research Enhancement Fellowship, Research Professional Development Fellowship, and the Dissertation Completion, uh, completion uh, Fellowship through Michigan State University. She was also included in a collaborative arts and design research project through the College of Arts and Letters with faculty and students from various departments on campus. Recently, Chelsea was awarded a Frank and uh, Adelaide QC Memorial Scholarship through the James Madison College for Holocaust and Genocide Studies. Very recently, Chelsea is the recipient of the 2019 John and Susan Birding Family Foundation Master of Fine Arts Prize awarded by Tina Rivers Ryan. I'm more than happy to celebrate Chelsea Markson's MFA thesis work in addition to the fact that Chelsea uh, is teaching courses in the art, art history and design, uh, in drawing, color and design, and printmaking. Chelsea, 
also taught me personally uh, on different sites, religions, and state of minds in the American Midwest and from her experience growing up in Kentucky. Please welcome Chelsea. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I'll make this short and sweet for the last, um, last time here. Oh, are my notes here? Maybe. We'll see. Um, <laughs> so I'd like to thank a lot of people. Um, since my notes aren't up here, I'll just do it from memory. I hope that someone can give me a wave when I'm over 10 minutes. That would be amazing because I could ramble on into oblivion. Um, thank you, Kais, first off. It's been such a pleasure. Oops. It's been such a pleasure to spend time with you. Um, I'd also like to say a thank you to my committee, Paul Katula, Adam Brown, Blake Williams, and Kelly uh, what else did I have on my list? So many other people. <laughs> the grads, oh my goodness. The community that we have cultivated over the last three years is incredible. I feel like we've been through a lot together and that only made us stronger. I would like to send a special thank you to Karin Zitowitz for leading our fearless leader. Thank you. Um, ben Van Dyke for our another fearless leader. So many other fearless leaders. Robert McCann, our supervisor. Who else? Luann, my dear Luann, my dear Jackie. Oh my goodness. And my dear Marcos, my dear Loren, my dear, <laughs> oh my dears. <laughs> oh gosh, okay, I'm going to stop now. <laughs> I'd like to send a special thank you to Marcos, who this, my thesis project upstairs could not be possible, and I'll explain more of our collaborative roles later um, in my presentation. Last but not least, I'd like to thank my parents who are in the audience, Barry and Eleanor Markison, who have continuously throughout my life supported my self-expression, and I could not make um, this difficult and important work without them. So thank you all so much. <laughs> um, in the meantime, I'm going to give a brief background on my history as an artist, and then I'm going to just dive into straight up talking about what's upstairs, um, keep that pointed into how I created the work that you may have seen up there. My background is actually in drawing and printmaking. And over the last three years, I have expanded into performance installation and recently video and sound. And I think that I'll give you a little behind the scenes on how that happened. Um, in my studio, I was doing these actions that um, seemed to be really important to the work that I was doing and I recorded them. And what I found was is that they were very reminiscent of a ritual and they were very reminiscent of a ceremony. And in the studio, I was attempting to um, channel uh, basically the pain in which I have experienced in my life. We can all relate um, to those emotions, but I was also channeling um, the troubled times in which we live in. And this prompted me um, to dive into my identity and the things that I believe in in this world. Um, I began to assign meaning to the materials I was working with. As you can see up here, I'm working um, with sheets and water, and I am kneeling down in front of a bucket. Um, I devised this ritual as a means to heal myself and to also heal others who are around me. This performance um, confronts trauma. It also confronts grief and memory, and also loss. Last summer, I had the privilege to attend um, the Pilotenkirche residency in Germany. And it was here that I wanted to confront uh, my family's generational trauma after the Holocaust. 
and being in a place that triggered me so much, I was prompted to take this performance that I was cultivating in my studio and um, bring it to a site in Germany in order to attempt to heal myself and also to tap into the energies in which the site is. This is um, what you see here is at the Holocaust Memorial in Leipzig, Germany. And it was at this site. I promise it won't take you too dark. I'm only going to be here very briefly. Promise. Um, <laughs> anyways, this um, was a site of a former synagogue that was destroyed on Kristallnacht. You may have heard of this. It's the Night of the Broken Glass. This synagogue was destroyed by um, SS forces. Um, and we know that story. The chairs represent um, the 14,000... Um, it's 140, but it's uh, 14,000 Jews who were murdered in the Shoah in Leipzig. Um, I attempted to confront this site, uh, in asserting myself as a living embodiment of survival and hope for the future. It is also my hope that I uh, asserted my body into this site using a ritual that I devised in order to confront my own traumas of the past and also to perhaps give a hope uh, to the future as well. When I returned um, back to Michigan from the residency, which I spent three months in Germany, I was motivated to create work that also in a community here. And when I was in Germany, it was amazing to be in the Jewish community, what is left of it, and to do work that is uh, very difficult. And I wanted to come to Michigan State after um, returning back from Germany. And I thought to myself, how can I bring the ways in which I have uh, use this performance and I go into a tra trauma identity when I go or like this traumatic state when I do this work. Um, I felt that last year after um, after Larry, I don't really want to say his name, um, but I will move on to the next slide. The thing is, is that um, we all felt the seismic shift after, in the aftermath of Larry Nassar. It touched everyone. It was spread, and, and we couldn't not feel that. It changed my studio practice. It changed the way that I can confront my own past and perhaps um, inspire others to confront their own as well. I felt that the ongoing corruption at here at Michigan State was more unnerving to me than anything. And I felt that the symbol, the um, Hannah administration building here on campus, became a symbol of the ongoing corruption and mishandling of the traumatic events caused by Larry Nassar. And I wanted this performance to bring the community back together and to somehow provide a way of healing the cracks in our MSU community. I'm going to backtrack a little bit and talk about the materials that I use in the performance and in my own work that are indicative of healing, transformation, and also a symbol of um, memory and how we can transport that. I use water, and water is a medium of purification. It's also a medium of destruction. I use bed linens, which I have referred to as a site of sexual violence, and also a material in which the um, in Jewish burial traditions covers the corpse after a ritual purification of the body using buckets. Um, and all these influences went into my material choices. 
And I believe that ritual has a way of um, repetition. Ritual has a way of grounding us in the community. I think that coming together in a ritual is um, very important to overcoming our collective and individual traumas. And I believe this very much. Uh, I believe this because I've attempted to heal myself through these actions too. And I will, hopefully I'm not taking you all too much on a dark path here. Um, when I thought about what I wanted my thesis work to be, I wanted it to be, um, I was really trying to overcome a lot of fear of doing this kind of work, of doing work that is not only bearing a part of myself that um, is in the public, but also that the personal is political. 10, I'm at 10, oh my goodness. Okay, thank you. Um, I was going to show you a video, but I'm not going to, you can see it upstairs. But really briefly, thank you. Really briefly, um, I thought that I, I could sync the, the videos together in a way that was um, a call and response between the two. And conceptually, um, I trusted that the ritual and the labor of the two sites and my two movements would kind of be um, off kilter to one another. And upstairs in the gallery, they are playing, so when I, when I do an action, the other one does something in response. And so there is this back and forth in which you can be cognizant and aware, and the viewer can be aware of both of them simultaneously. And the sound of the water is disconnected from the two videos, um, and so that the sound of the water of plunging and ringing out is the unification of the two. Um, I'll move on to how I built the piece really quickly. So the piece in the middle is built by similar action of the performance, but I really appreciate the Broad for allowing me to use about 20 gallons of water to wash each of these individual sheets um, by hand on last Wednesday. And <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, the, and it's important that I do this kind of action in this space. Uh, the, the pile sheets are indicative of a large amount of loss. They're in a circle for unity. Um, there's a bowl in the middle that is constantly soaking up liquid. Um, as a metaphor of time and shame and also um, stigma. Stain is sh stigma. Um, the title of this piece is Burn Child's Children. It's inspired by a poem by Eric Fried um, discussing what we are capable of um, having no fear after traumatic events. Ashes are fearless that he ends with. Uh, this is the last slide, and in this installation upstairs, um, the sound is in, the, you'll, you can walk around the, the form on the floor, and um, the two video projections are playing simultaneously. Since I'm running out of time, a little bit distracted, but I would like to... Um, pay a very big tribute to Marcos Seraphim. Um, I've never experienced such an amazing spirit of collaboration. I now believe in the power of collaboration. I had a vision, and Marcos, my friend and collaborator, believed in my vision, believed in me, and believes in the power of making art. And this project would not be possible without you. Marcos filmed and edited um, with me simultaneously as I went through the vision of this work. And also Michelle West Davis for, f for filming the uh, performance in Germany. And also Mary and Loren for assisting in the performances at the cold 18 degrees at, uh, at Michigan State. The one on the, on the left there is, it was a very cold day. <laughs> So thank you all. This has been one of the most difficult and amazing experiences of my life. 
being um, a graduate student here and going working so hard and unearthing ourselves has been one of the most rewarding experiences of my life. And I'm so forever grateful for this opportunity. And with that, I'll turn down the mic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for your really insightful, thoughtful, critical analyses of your work. I think I speak for all of us when we say we greatly benefited from it and it's really expanded our um, understanding of your exhibition, so thank you. Um, in the interest of time, I think I'm going to address one question that I think applies to all of you. Feel free to answer um, as, you, as you will. And then I'm just going to ask each of you one question and then we'll open it up to questions from you all. Um, so, in working closely with all five of you, I've really identified um, language as a common thread throughout your five practices and five exhibitions. Um, Loren and Murdad, you're both writers. Um, text features very prominently in your um, work. Chelsea, um, you cite an Eric Fried poem as the title of your sculptural work. Mary, uh, your robot incorporates a resuscitation of your daily schedule. Um, and Andrew, you cite language as a system that you particularly seek to unpack. Um, so I'm just wondering if any or all of you can elaborate on the role that language, text, and literature plays in your work. I'm just, I'm just kidding, but yeah, I do shut up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess, I guess I'll go first. I'll start this <laughs> Yeah, so language, it's just really the way that I, writing's the way I process. Um, it's from, you know, early on as a child I was writing and um, I honestly sometimes think that I'm more of a writer than I am a painter. And I know that's not true, that's just something that I kind of go back and forth with myself about. But writing has been parallel to painting um, the... If I, I'm, I start out my day sort of in, in the studio in sort of a ritual sort of way I read some read one poem at least, um, and then I write and respond to it, and then I move to painting to get myself in a headspace. Um, I think that for a long time I thought about text and writing and painting as separate, but and you know, one I couldn't have text filter into the actual painted surface. But then I thought, why why wouldn't I want the text to read as imagery? Why wouldn't I want um, a word to create a layer on a painting just as a color might? Um, so I guess that's Actually, Loren, you've inspired me to to put that poem as like an inspiration and title of my piece upstairs. It kind of gave me the inspiration to take um, a poem and kind of have that as a catalyst to what that piece could mean. So it kind of gave me the courage for that. Yeah. <laughs> um. When it comes to text or language, for me, it is like the way into like the construct that I've created. It is um, kind of the catalyst or the starting point um, as a way to create form, and then from that new form, mm -hmm. um, you know, so, so the way into the system as a way of talking about more constructs, um, as a, a design tool, um, but as a way to for there to be something to a attach to for the viewer, mm -hmm. where there is this residual uh, quality that language could be found in it, so that there is this something that's trying to be communicated, so it starts the game, it starts this decoding process. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, 
I would say the text as a form, you know, uh, for me is uh, like the first stage of uh, visualizing and materializing my idea, my thoughts. But as a language, it works in a two way. In a, the first side, it can be works as a tool to communicate with your around, with your people, and as a as a foreigner here, sometimes it uh, works as a misunderstanding. You know, it's bringing me kind of the hardship. I mean, uh, like a different language or the language boundaries. So, as a graphic designer or as an artist, I like to play with the form. And uh, as a people, I like to play with the meaning. I actually am deathly afraid of writing. Um, you can ask my husband. And that's saying a lot, especially being having an art history background. And I apologize, every art historian out there. But um, I would actually prefer to do the research and give the presentation than write the paper uh, because of my dyslexia also. Um, but when the one thing that I really enjoyed about art history and text and the research was the stories. I love a good story. And I think that I try to convey that even in my own piece, um, a story within there. And that's one of the biggest things that I would have to take from that. Great. Wow. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, so now I'll ask each of you one question, and then we'll move on. Um, so Loren, we'll start with you. <laughs> um, I really see you <laughs> playing this dual role of um, artist and collector. And even just thinking about the title of your work, Remains Long Lost, um, do you any way um, think that you can view your exhibition maybe through a lens of archaeology, perhaps? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so to my family, I'm maybe a hoarder. Uh, <laughs> I've moved buckets of rocks with me every, in every home I've lived in. But um, I think archaeologically and anthropo anthropologically, um, these are all sort of through lines in my work. Um, the moss and the rocks and the dirt, these are all things that I dug up from the soil. There's something um, really interesting about the notion of taking, taking part of a place with you when you move on. Um, and so I think that, yeah, literally digging something from the earth um, fills in, it, it feeds my, my concepts. Um, and also in terms of time, um, the process of erosion, thinking about um, how some of the objects that I've uh, contained in the vitrines and the bell jars, these are continuing to evolve and grow and how that relates to memory and how um, these things that I've dug that some of them shrivel and die and other things have this new life about them and they, they continue growing. Um, so yeah, I think it's definitely in that way. Wonderful. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so Chelsea, I'll, I'll go in the same order that we went. Um, so, Chelsea, um, the labor of your practice is made really visible in your work, your performance work, your video work, your sculptural um, work. Um, and thinking about the title of your, um, your overall installation, Our Work Is Never Done, I'm wondering if you can talk about your decision to use that collective word, our, when talking about labor. Yes, so I decided to uh, title the entire project upstairs, Our Work is Never Done. And I decided that if I do this work that is primarily about me as the performer, mm -hmm. expressing a sort of um, release of myself, but also a release meant for other people too. So the plunging sound up there, we all know that action, like we've all been there. And that it's such a, like I've realized that it's a universal action of like anger or violence. And um, I felt like to be, to be encompassing of all of like the, the, the troubles of our times, like it had to be our, and it had to be a collective. Um, I'm, I, even though my studio practice is extremely personal, um, I, I always try to read theories and research of, of, the co of everyone and of, of all you know, different yeah. things. And so I think that um, 
the labor of us, that our work toward healing is never done. And knowing that it is something that goes on and on and on and on and on gives and releases us the burden that there has to be a um, end result in finishing um, and, and healing, whether that be um, even activism in communities, um, resistance, and um, all forms of that are healing us. Uh, speaking out, art, our own practices, all of my um, colleagues up here, and it's all connected and I feel like uh, it's, it is going back to the collective of that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Andrew, um, in your presentation, um, you spoke about the way in which your installation is always growing, evolving, it's always at play. Um, and you mentioned this to me. You said that um, your installation is um, site informed rather than site specific. I'm wondering if you'd be comfortable sort of talking about that distinction. Um, it's just something that I've when installing uh, the work a few times um, that I'm not making work specific for a site. I'm making work that can be flexible to different sites. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, maybe in knowing where it's going to be installed, that can start to shift in my way of thinking of how it's going to be installed, different techniques or uh, installational uh, hardware. Mm -hmm. um, and how it could fill that space or how a viewer could move through that space or I, how I could engage that space or activate that space uh, through this very malleable, very flexible, uh, open process. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's where that idea comes from about it being a site-informed, where it just informs it but doesn't necessarily dictate it. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so, Maradad? Um, you showed us an image of this, but your ex the exhibition opens with a sign that utilizes sort of the iconography, that red and white of the surveillance warning sign. Um, and I'm wondering how the artificial intelligence and facial recognition technology that you're using is recontextualized in the context of a museum as opposed to, say, in a mire when you walk into a grocery store and are surveilled. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there are two different ways of the data collecting and analysis of our behavior. So, as you told, for example, in my year, or uh, when you work online, uh, you watch a product, you can see advertising. So, they are always, you know, collecting your data, always uh, analyzing your behavior and recommending to you. Mm -hmm. So, this is uh, how this kind of algorithm works together. So, as an artist, uh, I just wanted to bring it in a different way. Because the recipe is the same, but we are, as artists and designers, should we design a prospect for that to make it more in service of humanity. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if somebody before me did something like this in, to bring in this kind of algorithm in the museum or uh, described as an art. And also, I wish I could make it outside of the gallery so uh, to, to you know, engage more people with that. But uh, the fact is, I wanna awareness, make awareness, or uh, show the people, first, how the system works, second, how we can make it better to develop our uh, living style. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful, thank, thank you. you. Um, so Mary, <laughs> um, <laughs> at the reception on Saturday, the juror, Tina, um, talked about how incredibly personal and intimate your installation is. And I know from our experience at Install, Mary actually had her son, her youngest son, Ronan, come into the space and play with the toys, um, which was, was pretty special. I've never, <laughs> never experienced that in the museum. Um, <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, I'm wondering when you were conceiving of this exhibition, did you have any reservations about how um, much of a glimpse you were giving all of us into your personal life, no. your family life? No, no, no. And what's yeah. really sad is that I should, probably should. And <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember at one point discussing it with my husband, um, but he's already dealt with my work exposing us too much before. I had robots, actually I made a series of to animatronic toys that I 
deconstructed and reconstructed to conception to finally birth and um, exposing me yelling at my son for the first time and him yelling back at me. Um, but yeah, I asked him during that point and he was like, that's fine if people really want to look at us having sex. So I figured at this point, I can do anything I want, right, honey, baby? He's laughing, so I'm gonna say yes. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, thank you again to all five of you. Um, I'd love to open it up to you all if you have any questions for our five artists. Um, love all your work, guys. I like follow you around all the places. Um, so what advice would you have to aspiring MFA students? Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm absolutely kidding. Um, Um, I think uh, go for it. Take the risk. Um, find the people that push you, uh, that challenge you. Find the place that's going to challenge you, uh, and take the risk to do it. You know, challenge yourself to go beyond what you thought. Experiment. Don't think. Don't come in with a preconception of who you are as an artist and what you are as a maker, um, and let that kind of be discovered and as you move through the program, as you are influenced by people, and just how you're influenced by even the people around you, your cohorts, and be willing and open to conversations that might differ from yours. Okay. This has been one of the most rewarding experiences of my life, but it's also meant that I had to let go of the previous work that I loved so much. And in a sense, I had to kill off that old work in order to make new work. And that is a very painful process for artists. And everyone up here has been through that cyclical process. But it's sort of this rite of passage of uh, becoming, um, uh, I hate using the word mature artist. Um, but that's the thing that came to my mind. Um, and that is what advice I have for anyone who's looking for the MFA experience. Thanks. And, uh, should I say two or no, that's enough? <laughs> no, don't go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, if, I, if you want to uh, repeat yourself, never go for an MFA. But if you want to change in your life, that, that would be a good start. I remember Marcos one day said something about the phonics process. So the phonics process about the MFA. So it's like a phonics. You should burn yourself first and reburn again. So yeah, you should you should start everything again in a new way and experience new things. I think also just I want to throw something in really quickly. Um, I think there's um, something. It's really important to consider the location that you uh, decide on for your MFA. Um, take as many visits to that university or campus as you can seek out faculty members, seek out current students, if you can even find um, who have recently graduated, get to know the place, you get to know the place through the people. Um, and I think that is um, one of the things that I've really loved about MSU is you know, the people here. Um, but yeah, be very um, cautious where you place your art because this is gonna mold you and shape you and uh, know where you wanna head in the future. I promise no joke, but. I would have to say, when you do, when you do finally decide to do an MFA, um, you should choose a place that you're going to enjoy. I mean, landscape-wise too, but also um, choose when you go there. Talk to the professors, and if you find a professor that you relate to, but also challenges you, go there. That was the first thing that I felt when I came here, talking to Laura. I just felt to myself, I have a connection with her. She relates to me very well, and she's not going to take any of my stuff. <laughs> you guys should all be proud of me because I curse a lot. <laughs> Ask my children. <laughs> but yes, find that professor who can relate to you, who will understand you, but will challenge you, and will not hold back. 
Thanks. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to say congratulations to all of you. Your works are absolutely amazing. Like, I'm extremely impressed. Like, this is super, super cool. Um, one thing I had noted, like, throughout all of your presentations was a lot of you came into the MFA program as, like, 2D artists doing drawing or oil painting. And through the MFA program, you found yourselves branching out more into, like, 3D art and installation. And I was just wondering, for those of you who it applies to, what really gave you that push to make you branch out into more 3D and like installation art rather than just 2D? So I actually applied here with my 3D art. Surprise! Um, I was a 3D ceramicist um, working sculpturally. Uh, I had bridged at one point, so I'm much older than um, a lot of the grads here. Um, I'm actually 35. And when I was first in undergrad, I know, right? That's old, guys. Prepare yourselves. No. Um, so when I was first in undergrad, I wanted to be a cartoonist. And everything um, in cartooning became digital. And I hated that. And I hated the computer. And I did not want to become a graphic design artist. I am sorry. Sorry, we're dead. <laughs> but um, I found my second love, which was ceramics. And I loved it to death. And when I went for my second undergrad in art history, I couldn't give up my art because that would be crazy. I needed a break from reading. So I started working with the sculpture teacher there instead of working with ceramics. And he, Thad Duhigg, pushed me to become the 3D artist that I am today even further. And then Laura pushed me farther. And now you see the work that's upstairs. So as long as you keep getting pushed forward, I feel that as an artist, you have to evolve. Whether that is in the, if you stay in the medium that you're in, that's awesome. But as long as you keep on evolving, that's where you become a great artist. Um, I think for me, uh, it really kind of started with the, this notion that uh, our understanding of a situation is relative to our position. Uh, and just diving into that idea with just staying in two dimensions, you know, depending on your position, it pretty much stays the same. So it was following that concept, it, the work needed to move into another dimension, talking about systems colliding, uh, then <coughs> physically systems need to collide, the understanding between two dimension, three dimension, space, and the relativity of all that needed to collide and need to expand. I just have a, a quick response to this. Um, but I think my initial reaction is um, we've all found work that seems very authentic and genuine to our practices. And um, that's not, you know, moving into installation or three dimensional or, you know, staying as a two dimensional artist. It's what works for you and your artistic voice. And um, I think it's, you know, kind of maybe strange that we all sort of have moved towards installation work um, at the same time. But um, I also think it talks about, it, it speaks to um, just society as a whole right now. Um, in the art world, we're all about interdisciplinarity, but also in life, we're all about experience and seeing, you know, we want to feel something. And I think um, you can feel something when you stand in front of a painting. You can feel something when you have to move around an object or a form. You can feel something when you have a projection in front of you and um, your shadows become um, a part of the projection. So I think um, it's, it goes back to maybe where society's at. We want to feel. I think they covered it for me. Yeah? yeah. Okay. Great. Let's, does anyone else have a question? No? Okay. Well, I think we're exactly at 9 o'clock, if not after, so that's perfect. Thank you guys truly. Um, this has been a wonderful program. Mm -hmm.